Okay, chapter 15 is on temperature, heat, and expansion. And certainly temperature is something we think about every day if we, uh, if we ever check the weather on our iPhone. So what is temperature? Well, temperature is a number that corresponds somehow to the warmth or coldness, coldness of an object. So something might be warm, hot, cold. There's a number associated with all of those feelings. And you can measure that number with a thermometer. So it's a per particle property. Something uh, with more particles doesn't necessarily change its temperature. There's no upper limit on temperature, but there is a definite lower limit, which we call absolute zero. Temperature is proportional to the average kinetic energy per particle in a substance. So for a gas like you see here, these uh, molecules are moving around with some average speed and giving it some average kinetic energy. If that increases, that will increase the temperature. For a liquid, the temperature is related to how fast the particles are all sliding and jiggling past one another. And for a solid, it's how fast the particles move as they vibrate uh, in place. So a thermometer measures temperature usually by the expansion or contraction of a liquid. Sometimes there's a mercury thermometer, sometimes uh, like a red alcohol. But the reading occurs when the thermometer and whatever you're measuring, the object, come into thermal equilibrium. So they have the same kinetic energy per particle. And an infrared thermometer operates by sensing the infrared radiation from, from the object. So there are three temperature scales mentioned in this book. One is Celsius. Celsius has the very simple property that it's zero degrees Celsius for the freezing point of water and 100 degrees Celsius for the boiling point of water. And there's 100 degrees in between there. Fahrenheit uh, three, is 32 degrees Fahrenheit for freezing of water and 212 degrees Fahrenheit for the boiling point of water. And there's no real advantage to using Fahrenheit. It's just a historically traditional uh, scale. Kelvin uh, has the property of 273 degrees Kelvin for freezing of water and 373 Kelvin for boiling of water. This is, has an advantage in science in that zero degrees Kelvin is absolute zero. And it has the same degrees, uh, size degrees as the Celsius scale, but it has this advantage, uh, it's sometimes called absolute temperature, that it is directly proportional to uh, the kinetic energy per particle. Heat. Heat is a form of energy uh, that is transferred from one thing to another due to a temperature difference. It's energy in transit. And heat naturally flows from high temperature objects to low temperature objects. So for example, this coffee is high temperature and the hands around it are lower temperature, so heat will naturally flow out of the coffee and into the hands. And heat can never flow unassisted from a low temperature to a higher temperature object. So heat can be measured in joules, since it's a form of energy. We also use uh, the unit calorie for energy. Uh, it turns out 4.818 joules of heat are required to change the temperature of one gram of water by one Celsius degree. We call that one calorie with a lowercase c sometimes measured by burning a peanut. Okay, so energy ratings from foods and fuels are determined uh, by burning that food and, and looking at how much energy gets released. So another unit of energy is subtly different. It's the calorie with a capital C, okay, sometimes called the kilocalorie. It's a thousand of the calories defined from the previous slide. And that's the amount of heat needed to change the temperature of one kilogram of water by one Celsius as opposed to one gram for a lowercase c cent calorie. Specific heat capacity. So this is a property of any substance. Spe specific heat capacity is defined as the quantity of heat required to change the temperature of one kilogram of the substance by one degree Celsius. It's like thermal inertia. And any substance will resist a change in temperature. And how much it resists it? is determined by its specific heat capacity. So this water bottle has a, a high specific heat capacity, so if it's hot, it stays hot for a long time. 
So different substances might have different uh, specific heat capacities. For example, iron has a higher heat capacity than, uh, than silver. So it takes about two minutes to raise the temperature of this iron pot uh, to boil water. But if, if the same size pot was used but made of silver, it could take less than one minute to raise the temperature uh, to boiling water. So water itself has a very high specific heat capacity. It's higher heat capacity than almost any other substance. And it involves the number of ways that the water molecule can absorb energy. So you can uh, absorb energy by the jiggling of the molecules, but also internal vibration between the hydrogens and the oxygen, or rotation. Okay. So this particular shape of the water molecule allows it to absorb energy without even increasing its translational kinetic translational kinetic energy. So specific heat affects climate in the sense that land has a smaller specific heat capacity than water. So ocean currents can carry a, a lot of heat from, for example, in the Atlantic, from the Caribbean regions up northeast to, to warm uh, the Western European countries. Thermal expansion. So, when a substance uh, has an increase in temperature, the molecules are jiggling faster, and so therefore they usually move further apart. And that expands the whole substance. So most substances expand when they're heated and contract when they're cool. For example, railway tracks can, on a winter day, might, if they're laid down, if they expand on a summer day, they sometimes will buckle, as shown in this picture. Another example is a trick a lot of people know, which is that if a metal lid is stuck to a jar, if you run it under hot water, it can expand the lid and make it get unstuck. Thermal expansion plays a role in construction. For example, there are often expansion joints that you'll see on bridges so that if the temperature increases, these uh, interlocking uh, pieces of the joint will close together. On a cold day, they'll get further apart, but the bridge won't uh, won't get have a hole in it. Also, the gaps on sidewalks are uh, allow for the concrete to expand in the summer and contract in the winter without cracking the con concrete. So different substances expand at different rates, and uh, this is used in bimetallic strips. So if you have a bimetallic strip of brass. Uh, right against uh, iron, well, it turns out that there's a greater thermal expansion for brass than there is for iron. So if you put, if you cool uh, a bimetallic strip, the brass will, will contract more than the iron and it will bend up towards the ice. Room temperature, the bimetallic strip might be straight, but if you heat it, then the brass will expand more than the iron will and it can bend it the other direction. So bimetallic strips will bend different amounts depending on the temperature, and that can make a thermometer, it can make a, something that will turn on or off a heater or an electric toaster by uh, making an electrical connection based on the temperature. So there is one ex exception to the rule of thermal expansion. Normally, you heat something up, well, it expands. Well, the exception is when water turns to ice. When water becomes ice, the temperature goes down, but it expands, it, the, the, the volume goes up. So that's because of just, again, the crazy water molecule. It has this open crystal structure that results from these strong bonds at certain angles. So this makes ice less dense than water. And Hewitt shows this rather complicated graph, which just shows the volume of one gram of uh, H2O versus the temperature. So ice. Has a, uh, one gram of ice has a volume of about 1.09 milliliters. If it melts and becomes water, well, that volume drops down. It becomes more dense. If you zoom in on this little part, you will see that the density continues to increase so that the most dense uh, temperature for water is plus 4 degrees Celsius. Then if you keep increasing, the water gets less dense again as, as it expands. It continues expanding until it boils, and then uh, water vapor has a very, very low, uh, low density. 
So when ice freezes to become solid, its volume increases tremendously. If you cool solid ice further, it will contract a little bit, but the density of ice at any temperature is still much lower than the density of water, which is why ice always floats on water, something that this polar bear knows pretty well.